Israel, God tells us to do one thing. Uh, there's one assignment for us. He said, pray for the peace of Israel. See, we got to understand Israel's connection and significance to us. We can't overlook that. I know I got to spend some time teaching it. Do you understand that it was Israel's assignment to give the revelation of who God was to the world? None of us in here would know God, who God was without Israel. He chose them to introduce himself to mankind. He's, they are God's chosen people. Amen? They are the first entire nation that shall be saved. God is just waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles. That's us. He's going to bless us so to bring them unto jealousy. Their whole nation will convert. It'll be, it will spark the end time revival that will also ultimately end up in the consummation of the age and the return of Christ. These are things we need to understand our connection with, with these things so we can understand our destiny is bigger than our personal issues. Amen? See, personal issues become a prison where you don't understand there's a purpose bigger than what's going on personally. Hallelujah. If I'm called to survive Florence, I might die. But if I'm called to minister to the world, I can't die until I get to the world. Florence can't kill me. My purpose is too big for me to die here. Did y'all cry about Shanda? My, my purpose is too big for me to die. My purpose is too big for these demons in Florence to ever get me to quit. I need you to slap yourself on the chest and say my purpose is bigger than these problems. When you know your purpose, you understand the present tense problems don't even carry the power to take me out. I got places to go and people to see. Glory to God. Glory to God. So I thank God for that. Well, I'll give you more on that, amen, um, with Israel. But I just want to just take one moment. We're going to pray for Israel. Father, I thank you. And I bless you right now. Your word declares, pray for the peace of Israel. And so, Lord God, we just thank you and bless you that your chosen people. Lord God, the, that which the covenants came through. That which, oh Lord God, the revelation of who you were came through. That uh, for which all the agreements and the connections came through. Your, your firstborn son. Lord God, the, the, your firstborn son as a nation. We pray, oh Lord God, for their protection. We pray for their keeping. We pray, oh Lord God, that right now their leaders are safe. We pray that civilians are not lost. And Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, that first and foremost Israel be blessed. But we ask even right now in the name of Jesus, show mercy on the Arab nation. Lord God, show mercy on them. Oh Lord God, but don't allow any weapon that they form to ever work. We bless you and we thank you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, all of God's people said amen. Amen. We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord. Listen, we had us a baptism this morning. Man, I'm, I'm so thankful for what I see God doing. Amen. And the power of God was so there. And the present, the witness of the Spirit was so there to seal what happened. And I'm just so thankful today. We had Miss Latasia Kelly who came and was baptized this morning in our, Dar in our Darlington campus because we got a baptismal pool in Darlington. We ain't got one here yet, but we're going to put one. Wonderful, wonderful, beautiful young lady that I've known for quite some time and just seeing God transition and just what the hand on your life. So we're just excited. Amen. For the new, new place God has you and, and the direction he's taking you. Amen. So I'm going to just read this. It says certificate of um, baptism presented to Latasia Kelly. This certifies that the aforementioned individual has publicly confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and has been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit at Glorious Remnant Revival Community. Amen. Bless the Lord. That is your sweetheart. Hallelujah. 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 God is so good. God is so good. Listen, I have some things that I want to share with you today that I believe are very, very important for assignment. I, I believe some people die because they don't know the assignment. They would have survived what they would have survived had they known what they were called to do. They would have known what was happening couldn't kill them. Amen? So I, I want to deal with some things because we have to pick assignment back up. 
we have to pick up a consciousness of what heaven's agenda is. What, it, what is it that God is trying to accomplish in the earth? Amen? What is it that he, what does he want to do, and what's my role in getting it done? Amen? Because everything created has a purpose. I was talking to a young lady, was one of my, that she's one of my clients, and she said, it's so funny that you called me because I was just thinking about the world and God and, and, you know, is there a God and so forth and so on. And I told her like this, I said, you have to understand the reality of intelligent design. It, everything that was created was created for a purpose. What, what am I supposed to be doing while I'm here? Everything created was created for a purpose. You look at a screwdriver, it has a purpose to screw screws. You look at a hammer, it has a purpose. To hammer nails, you look at a car, it has a purpose. There's nothing created that doesn't have a purpose. And I said, guess what? We were created too. So you do have a purpose, but the, the key is this. If you're going to know your purpose, you have to know the one who now created you. He's the only one that can tell you what that is. Amen? And so we have a purpose. Come on, somebody say, I have a purpose. Amen. I have a purpose, and there's nothing more imperative than us fulfilling the purpose for which it is God has brought us forth for. It's not just not going to hell after we die, even though that's important. That's signed, sealed, and delivered up front. If we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, that's sealed up front. Amen. But I want to talk about entering the kingdom. And we don't enter the kingdom when we die. We enter the kingdom while we're still living. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it what? See, it's, salvation is about not going to hell when you die. The kingdom is about not going through hell while, you, while you're still alive. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth. Where? where? Heaven on earth. Now. I'm not supposed to be going through hell now. If I'm in the kingdom. Amen? If I'm in the kingdom. And so, so I want to share some things that I feel like are necessary. And I'm going to go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 4 through 11. I'll read that. And I'm going to deal with some um, foundational... Uh, a foundational... Um, facet of, 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 of Christianity called faith, but I'm going to deal with it from some different perspectives uh, that I believe are necessary to reiterate for assignment's sake. I don't think we, we've had a generation who's been so, so purposeless as this generation. I believe we've become spoiled and been made fat. Um, by the blessings of God to a degree that we begin to believe our purpose is just to sit back and enjoy all the stuff that we got. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 4. Peter says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of, of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 5 is what I really want to work on for a while. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Everybody say, add to your faith. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. I say the kingdom, the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior 
Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we bless you right now for the power of God to preach your word in such a way that our lives would have to testify back to us. It, we can no longer live like we lived before we heard what we heard. Thank you that your spirit falls in the room. Thank you that your power is available to do whatever it is you want to do. And God will bless you, thank you, and magnify you for it right now. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. All of God's people said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, verse number five says something so, so key that I want to highlight that I helped set up some things I want to want you all to understand about faith. Everybody say faith. We understand the imperative nature of faith. The Bible makes it clear that we could actually live our entire lives for God and never please him in one moment if we didn't do it by faith. The Bible says without faith, what? It's him. It don't matter if you showed up for every church service if you did it without faith. It don't matter if you was every prayer meeting if you did it without faith. It don't matter if you gave in every offering if you did it without faith. The outward act means nothing without the heart posture called faith. Amen. He makes it very, very clear that faith is an imperative aspect. But he says something in 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 5. Um, Peter now almost in a sense says something that, you know, as I begin to consider it, I said, well, hold on a minute. He said, and besides this, giving all diligence, he says, add to your faith. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, add to your faith, knowledge, add to your faith, temperance, add to your faith, patience, add to your faith, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. Peter makes it clear to us by saying what he says that faith isn't something we're simply supposed to have. Faith is something that must be added to. Add to your faith. Our ultimate assignment, please hear me, isn't just to keep the faith, but to add to our faith. So many believers wind up spending their entire life doing what? Fighting to keep the faith. I'm fighting. I'm on the battlefield. I'm coming up the rough side. I'm fighting through the wilderness. Many saints spend their entire life fighting to keep the faith simply because they never add to their faith. Amen. Because a lot of people don't understand faith's ultimate attention is to be added to, not just to be kept as it is. And if I would have properly added to my faith, I wouldn't have to fight for it. Many people are having to fight for the faith because they got the same faith that they had when they were first exposed to God and gave their life. They have their initial encounters with God's faith and they've been now with God for 10 years and still living in that initial faith. Of course you have to fight for it because we're supposed to go from glory to and there's got to be another level of faith. I can't still be living off the faith that got me off liquor. I can't still be living off the faith that got me off drugs. I can't still be living off the faith that got me from chasing skirts. I, glory be to God. I, that My testimony has to progress. It, it, glory be to God. My testimony has to get bigger than that. Amen. So some people are still trying to live off of the same testimony that they had 20 years ago and wind up doing again what they were doing 20 years ago. They're fighting with the same sin because they had the same faith that initially got them past it. Now, if this is my bondage and God gives me a faith to step past it, I thank God that it's behind me. But guess what? It ain't that far behind me. Glory. If I, do, if I stop here, it don't take much for what I got past to get back a hold of me. Because I didn't understand that my faith wasn't just to get me past it. But I'm to go from faith to faith and, and get some distance between me and the issue. Me and the, I got to get some distance. I got to move on. I got to elevate. I got to expand. I got to go further. Amen. So, so many believers wind up spending their entire lives trying to keep a faith they were never intended to live off of. That was just an initial layer of faith. Amen. In this text, 
please hear me. I want to set this up. Peter isn't talking about believers without faith, but believers who have not added to it. In this portion of the text, he's not saying these believers don't have faith. What he's saying is this, the issue is they're believers who haven't added to it. And besides this, this is what he says, giving all diligence, add to your faith. He's not saying these believers don't have faith. His problem is they're not, uh, there's no addition. He said, make sure you have some addition. So ultimately what he's saying is, Peter, through his instruction is, you can have faith and it not be enough. I know we don't hear that much, do we? But there's a witness in the Bible where a man says, Lord, I believe, but what? Help, it ain't enough. Help my what? We can have faith in it, not be enough if we don't add to it. Now watch this. Add, you know what add means? Add means to supply or furnish. That's what it means. To add means to, everybody say, to supply or to furnish. Amen. Y'all don't mind if I just teach and slow down a little bit. I want to make sure you get this. So if add means add to your faith, it means to supply or to furnish. I want to look at to furnish. I want to look at that. If we go back to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 5, and we put to furnish in where we put where add was, that Second Peter verse 1 and 5 could read, and besides this, giving all diligence, furnish your faith with virtue. Furnish your faith with knowledge. Furnish your faith with temperance. Faith is required to access or gain access to furnishing. That the man of God may be fully furnished, prepared unto every good work. Now, faith is required for me and you. I need y'all to follow me to gain access to furnishings. Everybody say furnishings. Without faith, we're cut off from kingdom furnishings. We can look at kingdom furnishings like we look at furniture, right? Because furniture is actually furnishings. Everybody follow me in that way. Maybe you can understand what I'm saying. We don't get the furniture first, do we? We get the house first. Usually, amen, we'll get the, 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 the house before we get the furnishings because we need to know what type of space we need to know now the uh, the diagram we need to know the shape and so before we get the furnishings we first have to have a house in place nobody buys a leather couch for a front yard go ahead and put a, a leather couch in the front yard if you want to and see how long that lasts Nobody buys a plasma, plasma TV for their backyard. Go ahead and hook it up if you want to. See how long that lasts. But there are people who do sometimes get furniture without having a place to put it. So what they do is they wind up doing what? Putting it in storage. So many people actually have furniture in storage that they can't use because they have no house to furnish. And giving all diligence, furnish your faith with. So it is with faith. See, without faith firmly in place, there is favor. God, that God has stored for us. He has it stored up. But if there is no firm place of faith to fur for, for that furnishing to come in, we'll have favor that we ain't got no place to put. God can't find, I got favor for your life and I have no place to put it because the, I need faith. Uh, uh, the furnishings can only be added to faith and favor is a furnishing, but you don't have the faith. You don't have the space for that 
furnishing to be placed. Do you understand that there is life-changing anointing that God has to you, me and you have anointing to change our job space, to change our families, uh, to turn around strangers. We have power in prayer where God will tell us to pray for strangers in the grocery line and they get breakthroughs that's already there for us but there must be faith in order for that furnishing to have a place to be put so people actually have couches that they can't sit on people actually people actually have chairs that they can't recline in people actually have TVs that they can't watch I wonder if it's like that in the kingdom what if we got healing power that we can't use what what if we have grace to cast out devils that we can't operate in what if what if we have a gospel that should go to the nations but that gospel can't find any place to be put those furnishings can only be added to faith if there's no faith we don't buy furniture to put it out outside and God don't send down glory on something that, that is not walking in a faith that can house it amen and so there are destinies there are purposes there are doors there are authority to influence many believers will never experience because they ain't got no place to put it that's why God said without faith it's impossible to please me not because I because I can't bless you because I can't add to you because I can't release what I want to release in your life. Where are you going to put it? You can't put it in that worry space. It won't fit there. You can't put it in that stress space. It won't fit. Amen. So, so now, now watch this. So he says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Everybody say add to your faith. Faith isn't just something we have. Faith is something that must be added to. It is to be furnished. Amen? With kingdom furniture. Now watch this. 2 Peter 1 and 8 goes on to say, say this. This is why, he says, and he's given the explanation of why we need to add to our faith. Why we need to furnish our faith. Why we need to first of all have legitimate faith. And then we need to make sure that we're in a position where it can be furnished. Second Peter 1 and 8 gives the, exa- the, the explanation why. For if these things be in you, what things? The things that you are to add to your faith. Seven of them he named. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did y'all get this? He said the reason why you need to make sure your faith is furnished, the reason why you add to your faith is so that you won't be barren and you won't be unfruitful in the knowledge of God. Now, now you got to understand what he's not saying the reason is. He's not, it's not so you will be blessed, but so you won't be barren. Our problem is we have a bless me faith. He said, the reason why you add to your faith is not so you will be blessed. It's so you won't be barren. Because he's not talking to a people who don't have faith. He's talking to a people who are barren. In other words, you can be blessed and barren. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You can have the house and be barren. You can have the car and be barren in the knowledge of God concerning eternal things, concerning what God is doing in the kingdom. You have enough faith to be blessed but you ain't added enough to it to be fruitful so although you're blessed you're useless is what he's saying because you made faith about being blessed and I made it about reproduction I need somebody who can have a baby I need somebody that can push out the life of God. I need somebody that can break the winds of glory. I need somebody that can shift atmospheres. And all you want to do is take pictures by your new house and your new car. Where are the people who want to have a baby? You blessed, but you're barren and unfruitful.
in the knowledge of God. There, there's literally a church full of believers who have enough faith to be blessed, but never added enough to actually be useful. Did y'all hear what I just said? Ain't that scary? I don't know about you. Ain't that scary that you can have enough faith to be blessed, but still not have the faith you need to actually be productive, to actually be what God is looking for, to actually be what God actually gave you that initial blessing for to begin with? Don't, I don't despise the blessing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you not to be, man, look here. Bless me, oh Lord. It bless me indeed. Enlarge my territory. No limit. I'm there, kind of. Give me it all, God. I ain't turning none of it down. But I understand one thing. If I stop there, huh, if I stop there, I can actually become a heretic. And begin to preach the heresy that God gave you faith so you can get what you want. Instead of God gave you faith so you could fulfill his will. It is high time that we've lived after the lust of the flesh. But now it's time to live for the will of God. I didn't get all this so I can eat where I want, what I want to eat when I want to eat it. Because if the truth be told, there are times when I need to turn down my plate. Although I could, under, I could afford a $250 meal, there are times I need to fast. It ain't so I can go where I need to go because if the truth be told, there are vacations I don't need to go on because God is leading me in the spirit to an assignment. But because I made it about the blessing, I'm flying to California instead of driving to the hood because I thought it was about the blessing. Barren. And unfruitful. In the knowledge of God. You know what it is when a woman is barren? You know what it is when a woman is barren? Usually it's not that she, Tony, that she doesn't have the reproductive organs to conceive a child. It's that she can't use them. <sighs> she, she got them. But she can't use them. God is saying, look, when you said yes to me, when you got that faith, you got the ability, you got the ability to bring conviction to the world. You, you got the organs to call men to repentance. You got the spirit to witness the truth of God. But the problem is, when I wake you up, I can't use you. When you go to work, I can't use you. When you're at the grocery store, I can't use you. You're not available even though you're capable. You got the organs and ain't nobody hearing about Jesus. You got the organs and you ain't praying nobody to salvation. Do you know we can get on the altar for three hours and somebody gets saved because of it but we got nobody. Do you know we can change Florence if we just lay on this altar? My people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways that I would hear from heaven and I would now uh, forgive their sins and God said I'll heal the whole land. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying? I'll heal the land. I'll, you'll be able to drink tap water after you finish praying. You're going to clean up sewers after you finish praying. The, Faith isn't ju just for personal preference. Faith is for divine purpose. God, why are you favoring me like this? Every time God starts to favor you, you better get sober. 
When God starts causing your hands to be blessed, when he begins increasing your storehouses, when he begins opening ways and giving you favor, you better thank God. I ain't telling you not to be, but you better be thankful because to whom much is given, much, I know you ain't paying attention to how much money you're spending on the meal, but he is. Y'all know you ain't paying attention to what you could have done with that, that God would call you to do, but he is. He is. I, I need somebody to shout, God wants to bless me. See, don't, don't ever get scared. Don't be scared of it. No, no, no. no. God wants to bless you. God, God is saying, now, are you going to walk in the faith where I can furnish you with it? Are you going to say yes to the commitment where I can furnish you with it? Because I'm telling you, faith isn't something you say yes to on Monday and you get the furnishing on Tuesday. Faith is something you say yes to at 75 years old, Abraham, and you get the furnishing at 100 years old, Abraham. Faith is something you got to walk out for a while. Faith is something you got to go through some processes. Faith is something where you get the anointing David you get the oil poured on you at 15 years old but you're not going to actually sit on the throne until you're 30 years old because faith goes through a process the reason why we don't have faith that God can furnish is because we think that God works like social media we think we, we think God's going to be short fast and convenient Amen. And he'll literally tell us a destiny before we even are living like the person who qualifies to get it. Abram, you're going to be a father of many nations, but I ain't going to tell you, really, you ain't going to get it until your name ain't Abram no more. It's going to be Abraham. Simon, you're going to start a revival. I'm giving you keys to unlock the entire church age. But I'm telling you right now, you ain't going to do it as, as Simon. You're going to do it as Peter. He, do you know that Jesus, Jesus sat there and looked at Simon and said, you are Peter and on this rock I shall build my church. And the I know you're Peter. And then he turned around a few chapters later and said, Simon, Simon, the devil wished to sift you as wheat. In other words, I called you Peter. Peter before you changed that assignment but I'm about to take you through a process where you can be converted and have the keys that I promise you after I take you through the process of changing you whatever God said me and you ain't gonna get it like we are look at your neighbor tell your neighbor it's gonna cost you He said that you be not barren. It's the believer that God can't use because that believer hasn't made the necessary commitment to add to their faith. Add to your faith. We add to our faith not for blessing, but so we won't be barren. The blessing is built in. Y'all know that, right? If you got faith, the blessing is built in. That's automatic. Amen? You know what barren means? It is actually now the Greek word argos, argos, that you be, you be not argos, A-R-G-O-S. It literally means free from labor, at one's leisure, lazy, one who shuns labor that they ought to perform, one who doesn't want to do what they know God told them to do. The definition gives the characteristics, watch this, of the barren believer. They do what they do for God at their leisure. Free from labor. I'll pray, but that's at my leisure. I'll read the Bible, but that's at my leisure. I'll serve in the church at my leisure. I'll come to church at my leisure. I'll do it when it works for me. And what, that, what happens is it makes them or makes us useless concerning eternal things. Useless concerning anything that has eternal weight to it. He says you're barren. You ain't birthing nothing that's going to make it to the resurrection. Nobody is around you being impacted to grab a hold of God in a way where their life can be saved forever. Barren. 
concerning the eternal things. And it's not because they don't have faith. That's why a lot of people mess it up. No, they do have faith. They do actually really believe in God. They have faith. They just ain't adding nothing to it. They believe in God, and they believe God going to turn around their situation. They're just not useful. They're just waiting on God to change stuff, but they're not useful. They're not impacting anybody for God. Amen? Bless the Lord. So Peter says, barren, he goes on to say, nor unfruitful. We can have faith and be unfruitful, too. Barren and unfruitful. To be unfruitful is not to produce what one is capable of producing. You're capable of producing it, but you're not producing it. Can you imagine if me and you got an apple tree? Think about that, Australia. Me and you bought us an apple tree, and it didn't produce no apples. Right? What me and you going to do? What is... The logical thing to do, if I want apples, and I bought me an apple tree to produce them, and the apple tree I bought to produce those apples does not produce apples, what am I going to do if I still want apples? I'm going to get me another what? I'm going to choose some, another tree to give me the fruit. Y'all know I'm in the Bible right now. He's talking about I want somebody that can bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. He goes to a fig tree. And that fig tree, glory be to God, that fig tree, it was not even the season for figs. Glory. And God says, I want, uh, Jesus looks at this tree and says, we, I want some figs off of this tree out of season and the fig wasn't producing it but it wasn't the season for figs and so God curses the tree at the roots and say don't bear fruit no more why because even when we're out of season God knows the way that he blessed us we still we still bear fruit we still walk in blessing I'm not even in season yet and my prayer is shaking hell I'm not even in season yet and I'm laying hands on the sick and they recover I'm not even in season yet and whatsoever I do is prospering what God is saying is what I gave you called Holy Spirit is not controlled by season I will I need you to understand you're no longer subject to seasons. In the kingdom of God. I, I will produce like, and you'll think it's actually my season and you ain't even seen it yet. I need you to look at everybody tell your name. I know I'm blessed, but it ain't my season even yet. Hallelujah. You got to learn how to get fruit out of season. I could talk about it this way. And I desire praise the fruit of the praise is the fruit of the lips. Our problem is we don't know how to give it out of season. When things ain't work, if things ain't working, God's saying, can I get some fruit? Can I get a thank you? Even though it don't look like something is working for you to say, fact, can I get some fruit? Amen. And so I want y'all to look at this. This is what God says he does when he comes for fruit and doesn't get it because it ties into the kingdom. Matthew 21, put that up, verse 41. I'm just reading this. Y'all remember the parable of the, the vineyard workers when, when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a, a man who rented out his vineyard to husbandmen, laborers and gardeners. And he dug a trench around it. You know, and he built a tower in it and he put a wine press in it and he gave all these things for them to bear fruit. And then when the time of fruit came, he sent his servant, sent his servant because I didn't leave you with all that blessing. I, I just for you to say I'm blessed. I actually want some fruit. I want you to produce something for me. And they now beat the servants because they don't want to give up the fruit. So he sends his son, and then they actually kick him out and kill him so they can then begin to, to say the vineyard is ours. So they, take, so they can take control of the vineyard and claim that the fruit is actually getting a word so you don't lose your mind from Sunday to Sunday. 
Somebody done stole the vineyard. That ain't never the fruit that, 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 that the master said was supposed to be produced by that vineyard. Right? So then it picks up in Matthew 21, verse 41. It says this. They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will do what? Render to him what? God said, I want fruit. A lot of people don't understand they are blessed and fired. They're still enjoying the blessing God gave them, but they're no longer laborers in the vineyard. They've been fired. God won't take the blessing even though you're unemployed. I'm going to lease my vineyard to somebody else that can do what? Bring forth the... Come look at your neighbor tell your neighbor, we must be productive. All right, let me move on, and I'm going to get on up out of here. I ain't going to talk too much more. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Look at this. It says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 19, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is what? And cannot and hath forgotten that he was purged from his. Peter says when we don't give all diligence to furnish our faith, then he goes on to say we're blind. We're blind to what? Our assignment. We actually think making it through the week was it. Being able to buy what we want was it. He said you're blind and your blindness results in short-sightedness. You can't see afar off. You're short-sighted. You know what it means to be short-sighted? It means you can only see what's in front of you. Glory be to God. He said, when you don't add to your faith, faith is for long distance. Come on, let's talk about Abraham. We already talked about him. That, he had to have a 25-year faith distance. Let's talk about David. David had to have a 15-year faith distance. Amen? Let's talk about Jesus. He had to have a six-hour faith distance. Now, keep in mind, he was taking on the sins of the whole world. He said, but when we don't add to our faith, we have faith and we're short-sighted. We can only see what's in front of us. You ever wonder why some people feel like quitting one week and feel like going on the next week? Because they're short-sighted. Amen? When you're short-sighted, what's in front of me right now makes me feel like I can go on. But on Wednesday when I went to work, they showed up. So I'm ready to quit again. Why am I up and down? Because I'm, I can only see what's in front of me. Monday it was good, so it was good for me. Wednesday it was bad, so it was bad for me. You ever wonder why some marriages get divorces in the church? Because they're short-sighted. They can't see beyond the issue they're currently in. They, don't think it, they think it's insurmountable. Amen? So what short-sightedness causes us to do is make permanent decisions in reaction to a temporary situation. How many people are living in a permanent mindset off of something that was a portion of their childhood? That's what short sighted short sightedness causes you to react to something that's going to change by doing something you can't change. Why? That ain't going to be like that always. Why would you react and do something you can't change and that was going to change the entire time? But because you're what? Short-sighted. How many people do we see walking by faith that can't get stability, can't keep them encouraged, can't keep them strengthened, and we just think they, they need more faith in a sense they need to add to it and can't nobody. It's like, man, I done preached everything to them. I done preached them, I done prayed for them, I done oiled them down, I done encouraged them, I done, I done did all that, and they still struggling the same way. Why? Because there's some things you got to add. Peter said, you add to your faith. You got you to gotta go after God. You, you got to sacrifice some social media. You got to turn off your phone. You got to stop making verse images and actually read whole chapters. Hello? We got to stop reading 
excerpts and start reading whole books. Amen? There has to be a commitment. That's something that me and you have to do. We must now add to our faith. Because faith is being long-sighted. Everybody say long-sighted. Or, or far-sighted. You know what faith always says? Faith says there's something after this. I don't, I don't care what I'm looking at. I don't care how bad it is. Faith always responds, there's something after this. I don't care if there's something going on in my marriage in front of me. Faith says there's something after this. I don't care if something's going on in the ministry. I look at it and say, there's something I don't care what they're doing on my job. I can look at what they're doing on my job and I can say what? There's something. I just need you to say that right now because some of you uh, in your emotions are turned around. But what you need to make up in your mind is, is there something on the other side of this? And if there's something after that, then I'm not going to respond with how am I going to make it through that? Did y'all hear that? If there's something after what I'm facing, I'm not going to respond. How am I going to make it through what I'm facing? Because me knowing there's something after that already told me I'm going to make it. Whew. Faith looks beyond the cross. The Bible says he looked beyond the cross. And despite the reason why he could sit on it for six hours, because he looked after what was going to happen. He knew it was going to be an empty tomb. He knew the angels would roll away the stone. He knew that God would raise him from the dead so he could hang for six hours because he looked at the cross and said, there's something after this. So, when I know there's something after this, I'm not going to look at what I'm facing and saying how I'm going to make it through this. I'm going to look at what I'm facing and saying, what do I need to learn from this? What, what, how are you changing my mind through this? How are you altering my heart through this? How are you, you, you renewing me through this? How are you stretching me through this? How are you perfecting me through this? How are you making me more malleable through this? How are you making me somebody who can produce through this? How are you pruning me through this? How are you perfecting me through this? How are you changing my language through this? How are you altering how I see through this? How are you positioning me to be blessed through this? How how are you empowering me through this? How are you anointing me through this? How are you speaking to me through this? How are you leading me through this? How? I can do that because I got practice. Because there's some crazy stuff that pop off. But I already know I'm going to make it through. So God, what are you doing? Are you, are you enlarging my praise? Are you teaching me how to praise in the basement of a situation? Are you teaching me? What are you doing? Because I know there's something after this. Faith causes you to respond different to what you're facing. And it benefits you instead of almost killing you. So you got two people going through the same thing. And one of them is contemplating suicide. And the other one is up here like Tasha. Nah, y'all both fixing the same thing. Why are you dancing over it? And why are you popping pills over it? What's the difference? Somebody's short-sighted and somebody's long-sighted. Do you understand? It changes everything. When you're far-sighted, it ain't so good. You don't, you're not easily angry because you see beyond it. Is this going to be the end of everything? No, you see beyond it. You react different. Your stress level is different. Glory be to God. Your anger threshold is different. Your patience is different. You already see beyond it. Many times our emotional condition is based off of our sight. The condition of our sight dictates the intensity of the fight. The reason why some people are fighting is not because what they're in is so hard. It's how they see it. They can't see beyond it. So there, I'm fighting for my life and you really ain't. There's something beyond this. You're going through this so you can live. Learn how to live spiritually. Everybody still follow me? Amen. 
Last part. Second Peter chapter one, verse number nine. All right. Second Peter chapter one, verse number nine. I'm almost done. It says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was what? From, did y'all read that? No, I'm telling y'all. I'm, did y'all really read that? He says, when you're short-sighted, it's because you have forgotten that you were purged from your short-sightedness reconnects us to sin consciousness. I'm going to say that again. Short-sightedness reconnects us to what? Sin and have forgotten he was purged from his own sin. Most people who go back into their sin, you know when they go back into their sin? When they hit a trial. When they start going through, God had delivered me from cigarettes. But man, I went through something. And because I never added to my faith, I was short-sighted. And I forgot that I had been purged from cigarettes. And now I'm back smoking cigarettes. Man, I'm short-sighted. I was delivered from liquor. I went a whole two years without liquor. But when they walked out on me, I was short-sighted. And I forgot that I had been purged from liquor and now I'm drinking liquor again every you know when we go back into our sin it's not that we weren't delivered we forgot that we were delivered and when we forget we're delivered it gains access to bring us back into bondage I need somebody don't you dare forget he delivered your mind don't you dare forget he delivered you from drugs don't you dare forget he delivered you from perversion don't you dare forget he delivered you from depression don't be so, so short-sighted. When we fight what's in front of us, it causes us to forget what he delivered us from behind us. So we find ourselves bringing sins that we are no, that we were free from back into play. How many people know people who fell back into sin when they started fighting something? Come on. How many of us did that? My God on Zion. Maybe if I raise my hand, y'all be, I did it. I did it more than once. More than one time I did it. Mm -hmm. Sure did. But nobody told me I had to add to my faith. Nobody told me that. So I meet people all the time that actually but forgot they were purged. They actually have faith and they smoking cigarettes. You ever talk to somebody like that? They couldn't have no fault. Oh yeah, they do. They can quote some, 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 some can quote more scripture than you. They, they still drinking, they living in a way that they shouldn't. Why? Because they never added to their faith. So their short sightedness caused them to forget they were cleansed and brought them back into their bondage. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. It's hard when you know the way, but you trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. That's why it's so important that we move from short-sightedness. I don't know what's going on, but you shouldn't be that mad about it. I don't know what's happening in your life, but it shouldn't be taking your sleep away from you. It's not a time for you to fight what you're facing. You add to your faith. Man, it's time for you to add. Because that thing is overcharging you. Be, you know what Paul told the believers? I think it was a course. He said, be not overcharged with surfeiting, riotness, and worry. Sometimes we allow stuff to overcharge us. I don't know about you, but I don't like being overcharged. If I go to a place and they... And I know they tell me it costs twenty eight dollars and I find uh, um, I find out it was only eleven dollars. I got a problem because you over what charge me for that. Some of you going through stuff and you think you were supposed to cry that much, but you're being overcharged. It shouldn't cost you that many tears. It shouldn't cost you that many sleepless nights. It shouldn't cost you not being able to trust people no more. You're being overcharged. What you went through don't cost that much. I 
know you're paying that, but you wasn't supposed to. You don't know what I've been through. I believe you've been through it, but you wasn't supposed to pay that much. It's 12 years later. You weren't supposed to pay for that for 12 years. Short what? It causes me to allow something temporary to do permanent damage to me. How am I going to let somebody who betrayed me 12 years ago Calls me to look at y'all and say, I ain't trusting Nan one of y'all. Because last time I trusted somebody, they put me up under the bus. So God done told me. It ain't just, you know, the Spirit of the Lord told me, I got to watch you. <laughs> you being overcharged. That's short sightedness. Amen. Y'all following what I'm saying? No, watch this, and I'm closing. Watch you. <laughs> Joshua, Joshua Williams. <laughs> That's his name. I love him. I love him. <laughs> All right, now look at the result, and, and we're closing. Watch this, and I'm, and I'm closing after this. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 11. Watch this. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 11. It says, Look at what he says, the reason why we have to add. He says, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The purpose of adding to our faith is because that's how we make our entrance into the kingdom. So that there may be an entrance ministered unto you until the everlasting. Why do I need to add to my faith? So I can make my entrance. So I can enter into the kingdom of God. It's all about the kingdom. Do you know that there's some people with faith, but it doesn't give them access to enter? They're not in, they, they have faith, but they will not enter the kingdom. Because it's not about just having faith. Add to your faith. And if so, for such an entrance shall be ministered. Ain't that what it says? Amen. So there are many people who have faith that say, well, look, they got saved. You know, they had enough faith to get saved. So they believe God saved their soul for eternity, but they don't believe God going to save them from their crazy employees. That don't even sound right. So you're telling me you got enough faith that when you die, there's going to be a power that rises you from the grave, but you don't believe there's enough power to keep you another week on that job and you're going to quit. Maybe God has you practicing with that job the faith you need to rise from the grave. Count it all joy when I fall into diverse temptations. For the, for the trying of your faith, which is much more precious than gold that perish. Some of us claim that we believe we're going to heaven and we don't even believe we can get out the hell we're in with that same faith. Maybe God has us in boot camp. Maybe the hell we're going through is so the hell other folks are going to, we ain't going. Because there's the faith necessary. Read this last scripture and I'm closing. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 11, the Passion Translation. As a result, the kingdom's gate will open wide to you as God choreographs your triumphant entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Messiah. God will choreograph your steps when you just act to your faith. We got to break a short-sighted faith up in here. Everybody stand into your feet. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. 